Hello. In this and the next video, we're going to look at oil market economics, which relies on some simple algebra and arithmetic that can look kind of tricky on paper. So I've pulled off the public internet some academic research papers, and I've read through these for some important information and highlighted that, which I want to talk about. And so to frame the basis of this video on the topic, let's just take a look at some facts. These are from reputable industry publications and academic journals, so you don't have to worry about them uh, being fake news or uh, something like that since they've all been peer-reviewed uh, by scientists in the field and past rigorous review standards. So, let's see, the use of oil products contributes to about 35% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The oil industry itself consumes about 3-4% to 4 of global primary industry. So as the world uses more oil, more petroleum, uh, the supply becomes depleted, right? As we use more of a finite supply, uh, it, that supply decreases, of course. And then what supplies are left in the ground require increased energy expenditures in drilling, oil recovery, and oil processing, right? And so that increased energy intensity uh, is due in large part to increased work of lifting of fluids as oil fields change, as oil fields age. We're going to come back to that article in the next video. Here we have a case study of California oil. And a lot of times in these peer-reviewed academic journal articles, uh, the main ideas are here in the abstracts. And so we see the results indicate that the energy intensity of oil extraction in California increased significantly from 1955 to 2005. Again, that's because as the natural pressure in the oil field or in the oil well uh, decreased as that oil came out of the ground, then uh, they had to actually in invent new methods of extraction by pumping steam or oil water into, uh, into the earth in order to generate enough pressure to pull that oil out of the ground or also uh, substitute that pressure with, uh, with man-made pumps on the surface that, that extract it. So those require uh, significant amounts of energy and other resources, and we'll get into the details here in a moment. So that resulted in a decline of life cycle EROI, which is energy return on investment or energy return over energy invested, uh, from about 6.5 to 3.5. This is just a ratio or a fraction, and we can measure that in megajoules. Most of the decline in energy returns is due to increasing need for steam-based thermal enhanced recovery. This enhanced recovery is what most oil wells rely upon now, conventional oil that is. In a moment and in the next video we'll look at uh, some differences between conventional and non-conventional oil. In the old days, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, drill a hole in the ground and there was enough, nat enough natural pressure that the oil would actually spurt out and what they called the gusher. Uh, for those of you who've seen the Beverly Hillbillies opening credits, you know, uh, one day Jed was shooting at some food and up through the ground cub of bubbling crew because there was actually pressure in the earth that uh, made that oil spurt out like that. Now that pressure is actually less than the atmospheric pressure at the oil head and so they have to create an artificial pressure differential with pumps or with uh, injection. And so as these resources deplete, we have to come up with more efficient and different means of extracting them or else uh, these fuel sources become uh, less energy efficient and ultimately they're not, uh, they don't provide enough energy to society to overcome the cost and energy inputs needed to take them out of the ground. And so that's when we have to start looking at alternative fuels. And we'll get into that in the next video. Okay, so. The fossil fuels that consumers put into their automobiles are being produced by increasingly energy intensive produ production methods and from resources other than conventional oil. Again, conventional oil is that gusher that you can imagine. The these unconventional sources include like the Alberta, Canada tar sands or synthetic fuels. Uh, we, can make, uh, we can make gasoline from coal using a, a couple different methods. And then shale oil, a lot of people have heard of hydraulic fracturing and shale boom, tight oil, you might also call it. So 
Uh, light sweet crude is, is the easiest and the least energy intensive to bring from a well to the gas pump. And then what we have today are a lot of heavy and sour oils. Right, so we're looking at heavy oils in California. Bitumen, that's like a tar sand in Alberta, Canada. These are more difficult to extract, they're more difficult to refine, which means they're more expensive. And so that increased cost in, and difficulty means that companies need to refine their processes and customers might find that the prices are rising. So heavy oil requires injection of steam to decrease the oil viscosity uh, and induce flow within the reservoir. Right, so the oil needs to get out of the ground, so we need to add pressure to it. All right, so here we see on the y-axis, this is just a general graph. I mean, maybe it looks complicated because there are a bunch of notes here. These are milestones, and we can see the graph changed along with some of these technological discoveries and changes in industry practice. So this is a history of California oil production. The history of oil production in the United States uh, basically is the history of world oil production. Uh, since American companies pioneered the trade and um, continued to lead in technological and process development. And so we've got oil production in million barrels per day, per, and then this is over here of the year. You can see it was pretty flat from the beginning, right? And we had some hand pumps and relying on natural pressure in the ground, and then we get uh, some thermal recovery, right? Still not really increasing too much. Per day, this is mostly this period is mostly just by expanding the number of oil wells, right? So we get some ups and downs through the 1970s. This is where things start to change over here. You can see a general trend that's almost like a peak. People talk about peak oil a lot. Uh, that's not just some kind of conspiracy theory. That's because there's only so much oil in the ground. There are only so many wells to to drill, and then there's only so much pressure in those wells, uh, such that the energy intensity required to take that oil out of the ground uh, is less than the total amount of energy we're getting back. So we can see a couple milestones here. I've highlighted steam injection at Yorba Linda, right? We can see a relative minima here, right? And then immediately after steam injection was introduced, we see an increase. And then that only lasted so long, right? And we've got more steam injection, right? Steam injection and production refinements here uh, that are increasing the efficiency of the process right through the early 2000s when we, when a lot of experts are saying we actually reached peak oil production All right so here we've got a flow chart again it, it might look kind of complicated because there are a number of different variables here but we've got a key and so all of these different letters just are are different parts of the process right so Moving from extraction through fuel com combustion, we have a, a, a gross flow of crude oil. Right, so the flu flow of crude oil gets some oil from the well, it goes into refining, but some of that's lost in the process of extraction. Some of it's burned off, some of it is wasted. And then we've got energy inputs. We've got diesel fuel and power, electricity, various things that are required to take the, the oil out of the ground. Uh, and so some of that oil that is extracted from the ground, say whether it's Exxon or some smaller company uh, that's extracting it, it'll go through the refining process and then it has to come back into the machines that take it out of the ground again. Plus there's some external uh, power sources, again, like electricity. Okay, And we can come back to this in a moment. Basically, the, the main idea here is that there are external inputs and then much of the oil that is refined is sunk back into the process and then eventually some of it or most of it goes out to the consumers. All right, so we've got these concepts here, net energy ratio, this is just a, a fraction. The energy output, that's it's calculated in, in thermal units, megajoules or BTUs, something like that. Or EROI, which is energy return on investment. Uh, some of you in business classes might have seen ROI, return on investment. It's the same principle, right? So we've got the, the total energy output divided by the external energy and then the internal energy. External energy, again, is up here, right? This is the external coming from outside sources, and then the internal energy uh, is from within the oil company 
or within the process. Okay, so total energy out over total energy inputs is the energy ratio. And again, that's just a fraction. It might look complicated, but it really is just a fraction. We've also got external energy ratio, EER, which is uh, only the energy output over the external energy input, right? So it doesn't include the energy INT there, right? So I highlighted this here. Energy out is the final refined product output. You can think of that as gasoline or diesel. Energy EXT is the primary energy input from outside the studied system, such as primary energy to create electricity purchased from the grid. Energy INT is primary energy inputted from the feedstock resource itself. For example, crude oil burned on site for steam generation. Okay, let's continue. We've got a bunch of fractions here. This is just addition, sum, and then we're gonna take the sum of some things. This is the crude oil flows, and we're gonna divide that by the sum of some other things. This is the energy inputs. The net energy, the net energy ratio is just the sum of the oil flows at output over the sum of the energy inputs. Right, so just a simple fraction, basic algebra, arithmetic. Uh, same thing here from the point of extraction. The only difference is we're dealing specifically at the well header in the extraction process, right? So we've got the crude oil flowing out of the pump or flowing out of the, uh, the well head here. Then we've got the energy from external sources like electricity. We've got the energy from refined oil like gasoline or diesel to run uh, pumps and other motors. We've got XC1, which I believe is crude. Remember, some of the crude is burned directly to generate steam in the process. Some of it is also wasted. Uh, we could consider that. Uh, we consider, could consider that uh, energy consumed. And w, XWC, that's going to be here. W is wasted heat. XWC is not included here. We're going to consider XWC, that's going to be the wasted energy. So this will be the crude oil burn for uh, steam generation, and then this is just going to be the, the wasted crude. Right, so all of the crude products that go into it are the uh, denominator and the flows out of the extraction point or out of the well is the numerator. We're just going to divide those. That's a fraction. It's fairly simple. Uh, and then the higher the, the number, we want this to be greater than 1, of course, because we want the energy output uh, to be much greater than the energy input, or else it's not profitable or it's not uh, environmentally uh, sustainable. It's not uh, sustainable in a business sense. We can't make um, any money. We, you know, it, it, it's just not a feasible, pro feasible process if this... EROI doesn't equal three or some authors say five, right? So these are all very similar processes. The main idea is that the numerator is the outputs or the flows of crude oil and the denominator is the sum of all of the inputs. It may, might look a little bit more intimidating than it actually is. Similarly with this type of equation, you see this in a lot of economics textbooks. It, it looks intimidating, yes, uh, but it really isn't. It's, you were just multiplying here. All of these numbers are multiplied together. There's a plus sign here. So it's just a matter of knowing what these, what these things are. So I is a field. So the sum of, let's see, the total energy consumed in drilling. So XR1D, the total energy consumed in drilling uh, is the sum of all of these things in each of the fields. WI is the number of development wells drilled in that field. So we've got however many wells there are in that field times the average depth of that field, right? So that's the, uh, the total average depth of all of the wells. And then we've got ED, which is the energy requirement of drilling as a function of HI. So energy changes, the energy required drilling changes as the well gets deeper. Right, so we're going to take the average number of well, average height of the wells, multiply that by the number of wells, and multiply that by the energy required per foot or per meter uh, depth of the well, and then we're going to add to that the WEXP or the exploratory wells and assumed depth of exploratory wells. So WI is just the actual existing wells. WEXP is all the exploratory wells, 
And these two functions here, this one and this one, are the same thing. So the total energy required uh, in any oil field is just uh, all of the existing wells or fields and then all of the exploratory wells or fields and this is just the, the number of wells times the average height of the well times the energy required for drilling by foot. Right? So we're going we're gonna to multiply a few numbers together, add that to a few other numbers multiplied together, and then sum all of those numbers. It's really not nearly as complicated as it might seem. So this author, or these couple of authors, used data from uh, Canadian well drilling to find the relationships between the megajoules per meter, which is the, the energy required, and heat units per meter, and well depth, and they found that uh, it is a logarithmic function, right, natural log function, right, where the R values are 0.71 and 0.59, and so that means there's a strong relationship. There's a slightly stronger relationship in ener energy used uh, per meter when it comes to uh, lower depth wells, and then it it might get easier. Uh, there's a slight. It, there are different factors involved. The lower the lower correlation in the higher depth uh, wells means that there are just other factors involved. So we've got some addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Now we've just got an exponent. E is just a constant raised to uh, d, which is the depth, times 0 0.0005. These are not difficult functions. And so, let's look at some more of their findings here. We can see that over time, oil, total fluids produced on our axis over here, fraction of energy content consumed in lifting, over here and this relates this axis relates to our line this axis relates to our bar and we can see that oil remains relatively low as a total percent of the total fluids pumped out of these wells they used a whole lot of water in 1985 uh, maybe through some production method improvements by 1995 uh, they had decreased the amount of water needed. Maybe they were using some other solvents to increase the, uh, the flow of the, the fluids after injecting the water. And then by 2005, most likely because the well pressure uh, had declined considerably, they, they needed to pump in even more water to get even less oil out of the ground. So uh, again, we've got some more calculations here, very similar to what you see in economics papers and textbooks, right? So pumping efficiency is determined by mechanical losses, friction from well bores, and electricity generation efficiencies. These variables are all defined here, 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 uh, you would need to consult other sources in order to find them, right? So these would be determined by, uh, by a manufacturer of a pump. These would be determined on site through use of empirical data. Um, again, efficiency is just a matter of how much they do, uh, how much the, the pumps uh, work over how much energy is invested into that, that work. Right, so the external energy input is over here on the left, and then EP, so we've got negative EP, which is the energy provided by the pressure drop from the reservoir to the outlet of the well. So we've got a negative EP, assuming that there is a lot more pressure in the earth than there is at the surface of the earth, then that's going to help the oil come out once we sink our well down into that pressurized zone. And so then whatever, whatever pressure differential there exists will actually help us rather than hurt us. But we need to add to that even more pressure, which is the energy required to lift the fluids against gravity, and then the energy dissipated by the friction of flowing fluid and the pipe, right? So all of this fluid, oil and gas and steam and everything together has to come through a pipe, and there is friction even though it's oil, which is fairly viscous. Um, so well, as well as energy dissipated and friction losses from the mechanical system. So if the pump has friction, the uh, various elements of the process have friction involved in them. And a, a, e, 
A is the energy consumed to accelerate the fluid. Right? So we're adding up these different energies, the energy required to lift the, the, the fluids, the energy dissipated by the friction, and the energy consumed to accelerate the fluid. And we're going to subtract from that the existing pressure in the well, and then we're going to get the external energy output. So this is kind of technical jargon for industry people. But my main point here is that these types of equations are really not all that complicated. They are just fractions. And when you come across them, all you need to do is find what these things mean, right? And then you can get a, a better rough idea of what's happening here, right? So these are just equivalent fractions, right? So we've got E big G E big G, where is it? E big G. E big G I is nowhere to be found. Let's look at the second one here. M I, that's going to be the mass lifted times the force of gravity times the height of the well over the, okay, so this E big G I is really we can substitute numerators. This fraction equals this fraction. We've got the same denominator, so the numerator here, E big G sub I, must be the same as mass lifted times gravity times the height of the well. All right, there's our E big G I. And then we've got M O sub I and M W sub I, uh, which we can look at as the mass of the oil and the mass of the water together, All right? And then we can divide the, we can subdivide the efficiency of the pump into its constituent parts, motor efficiency and efficiency of lifting, efficiency of electricity generation, right? So again, main idea here, these mathematical equations in these economics papers are really not all that difficult. They're just full of variables, right? And it's really just addition, subtraction, multiplication, the division, and occasional, an occasional logarithmic equation or exponent. Right, so let's look at one more paper and then I'll come back in another video and we'll look at some data. As EROI, EROI declines below 10%, below 10, that's a factor of 10, so we've got uh, the energy return or the energy output is 10 times greater than the energy input, highly nonlinear price movements are observed. Right, so recently we've seen a, a reduction in, in oil price and that probably has something to do with the amount of energy required to drill oil, but there are other variables that we'll look at in another video. So this is a classic academic science paper. They've had some research questions here. How is EROI related to energy prices? What implications do EROI trends have over time? Or sorry, which what implications do EROI trends over time have for economic and energy policy? And what is required to ensure smooth trends and away from away from oil and towards substitutes. Our most important research question here for this video is number one, how are EROI related to energy prices? Right, and so again, estimated EROI of three or greater, some authors say five at wellhead or mine mouth is necessary to provide uh, fossil fuels to society. If we are not getting three times greater the amount of energy return, as we invest, then we no longer have automobiles and uh, planes and things that run on gasoline and diesel, right? We have to look for other energy sources or we have to drastically increase the efficiency of the process, uh, which given the trend over time is not impossible, but since we've seen such rapid developments in uh, efficiencies in the past 50 years, it seems also less likely that we're gonna have major breakthroughs, right? major revolutions in technology. So we're looking at very similar ratios here, the energy yield ratio, just think of that as energy yield ratio, that for U.S. oil production decreased from 17 in 1953 to 6 in 2000, as we saw in the last, in the last article, that's probably due to decreasing uh, pressure within the earth as they take more oil out. And so we've got uh, EROI, where line figuratively represents the magnitude or the, the, the greatness of energy flows. And so in this one here in C, uh, this is a energy sink where EROI would be less than one. This is an energy sink where the energy delivered 
is not as much as the energy uh, input. See, we actually need to come up with energy from outside sources to get anything delivered in society. So this is not efficient. This is not a profitable activity, right? Back in the 50s and 60s and the early days of the gushers, this is what we had, very little energy invested and a whole lot of energy delivered. Uh, as we're moving through time into shale oil, tight oil, tar sands, unconventional supplies, this is what we have with uh, relatively little energy delivered and a whole lot of energy invested, uh, which is it creates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and it's a very costly process. And so this article, again, has a lot of different algebraic and arithmetic uh, formulas for EROI and energy inputs and outputs. And so we've got the energy delivered out of the pump is equal to the energy gross, which means uh, the total energy delivered, right, minus the energy input plus the energy imported. And so we've got the total, total amount out of the wellhead minus however much we used from our own processes or within our own processes plus however much we bought from other people, right, and that's going to give us our net energy delivered there. And so since we want ERI of one or greater in order to have uh, a sustainable or a, a net energy creator rather than a sink, we've got that energy gross, and then we're going to multiply that by 1 minus 1 over ERI plus the energy imported, right? The, again, we've got multiplication. We've got subtraction. We've got a fraction. We've got multiplication, addition. These are relatively simple processes, nothing to get intimidated by. Right, so it can be seen that as EROI falls below 1.0, energy import, import is greater than zero, and then that's required to maintain energy delivered greater than zero. Right? So as we are less efficient at the wellhead, we need more energy imported from outside the process, and then we're not delivering as much to society, or in fact, uh, we're using more than we deliver. And that relates to cost, right? So the, let's look at this equation. So the cost, the total cost of energy sold in the world, right? So the total cost of uh, crude oil and gasoline and diesel and other energy sources sold in the world in period T, we'll call it a year, dollars per year. PET is the aggregate value of market price. Aggregate just means all of the sum together. The, the average market price of all the energy produced by all wells and mines in the period in, in a, in a uh, given a nominal dollar value, right? So we need units. Dollars per gigajoules, right? Joules is just a measure of heat or energy. How much does it cost per gigajoule, right? And then uh, times the, the amount delivered. So we've got the cost, right? The average market price per gigajoule. And then we've got how much is delivered right and then that'll give us the cost to society right so cost of market prices let's see next we developed a simple model for the relationship between pro production costs and market prices by saying that the cost to the world economy of net energy cet is equal to the cost to producers for making gross energy on a per gigajoule basis ce production t so ce is energy cost of energy production in a time multiplied by the gross energy produced the energy gross remember that's not subtracting the energy input over time multiplied by the markup ratio so the markup ratio is the the price that a company adds so they have to co they cost the company something to take it out of the ground that's ce prod t then they mark that up and then we multiply that by the total energy produced, gross, and we get the cost, uh, total cost of production. All right, and all these equations here are just using algebraic substitution from these other equations uh, to get down to this one here, number 14. That allows us to assess the relationships among market price. So we've got price of energy during a time is the fraction of the M, which is markup in that time, times the cost of production. So a company spends $100, and then they mark it up by 10%, so we've got $110. And then we divide that by 1 minus 1 divided by EROI. 
Remember if EROI is one, uh, well, that would be divide by zero. We'll just say EROI is just barely greater than one. And so we're going to uh, get a positive. Uh, so one minus, let's just see EROI is five. One minus one fifth is four fifths. If we divide something by four fifths, that means the price is going to be uh, slightly greater than this here. Again, fractions, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Here we've got some flow charts. So we've got tech improvements lead to energy input reductions, right? So as it becomes more efficient, we don't need as much energy input. And then the cost goes down, the energy return on investment goes up, and the price goes down. Right? So that's one of our, our possible scenarios. As we've got depletion increasing, that means the energy input needs to increase. And this leads to higher production costs for companies. This leads to lower return on energy invested. This leads to a higher markup, but that's a question mark. Uh, and as we'll see in some pricing uh, analysis in the next video, it's not necessarily true. And both of these scenarios lead to higher prices. Right, so price increases could be mitigated by market competition or price controls. All right, let's look at 13A and B. So price increase leads to markup increase, leads to more exp exploration. So as the world market increases in price for a number for a number of different reasons, then companies can increase their markup. That'll be more profitable for companies, so they ex increase exploration, and then their energy input increases, and their EROI decreases because they are exploring more, exploratory wills cost a little bit more. Uh, as the price decreases worldwide, this is leading with price. These two result in price, right? So these are production, technical, economic variables resulting in price rises or falls. And here we're looking at a second scenario where a price increase or decrease would lead to EROI uh, or technological uh, rises and falls. All right, so according to these authors, third interaction, that's number 13 here, is observed by reversing the implied causality between 11 and 12. So here we start, sorry, here we start with technology and company and economic variables we lead to price, right? Here we start with resource variables we lead to price. Here we start with price and we lead through company and economic variables to reduction in EROI. Right, so a price increase can lead to lower EROI if high prices lead to increased markup and provide capital for more exploration, thereby increasing energy output input to the production process, increasing the denominator, and physical scarcity limits energy production. Right, these are just possible scenarios which they come back to in a moment here. So let's take a look at these graphs. I know this is a lot of data for a quick video, uh, but the main idea here, again, is that this stuff is really not all that complicated. There's a lot of it, but it's actually pretty simple. So we've got EROI on our y-axis here. We've got time on our x-axis. So we've got uh, decreasing EROI around 1980, right? Starting in the 1970s, we actually had price scares in the 1970s. There was big oil shocks in the 1970s, right? And then we saw some industry responses, right, where they improved technology. Right, they enhanced extraction and they came up, came up with new technological uh, processes and they also developed non-conventional oil which increased EROI uh, after this initial fall from here's the peak EROI just after 1970. That's right around the time when conventional oil supplies uh, became a lot less feasible because the, the pressure in natural wells had decreased. We had used so much of the existing oil already that we had declining, uh, declining efficiency on wells and then it took about 10 years before the market and companies responded by coming up with new technologies uh, and increased efficiencies again. Right, so EROI remained approximately constant rapid decline in the 70s, increased again after the 90s, and then decreased again. So we're starting to see the downward trend. So we came up with the new technologies, 
now we're seeing a downward trend even among those because we're using even more oil right and it's becoming even more exponentially more difficult to get out of the ground and we just haven't kept up perhaps it's impossible to keep up with technological advancement at that same rate and so here on the y-axis we have oil market price time over here we can see that that oil market price spike uh, coincided with those significant EROI losses or reductions in the 1970s, early 1980s. And then it came back down to about normal after that. And oil price has actually been, oil price markup, excuse me, has been decreasing even in periods of very high oil prices. And that's because oil price is not, it's not 100% related to uh, the energy invested. All right, so here we have some graphs all put together on the same timeline. And we can infer a negative relationship between price and EROI just by looking at the graphs. And so here we've got oil price and EROI. You can see EROI dips, oil price rises. Oil producer price rises as EROI dips. But then even as EROI continues to fall here, Sorry, even as EROI rises, uh, so too do we see mild rise in oil producer cost, uh, yet we have relatively flat markup. And so that means that there's other variables more recently that are affecting oil price. Perhaps in the latter half of the 20th century, uh, this was a simple supply demand curve um, and the producer costs and efficiencies at wells uh, were more a factor of uh, how oil prices respond. Uh, we are still seeing some relationship between declining, declining EROI and rising oil prices, but oil prices, as stated in the previous article, are somewhat erratic uh, and nonlinear, uh, whereas EROI is relatively linear and, re and declining right now. So there's a lot more going on that we'll get into in another video. And so 13A is not happening. Remember 13A and B were those situations where we had price leading to EROI, price rise leading to EROI drop, price decline leading to EROI increase. And so these authors concluded that EROI is not falling because price is rising. They find that uh, EROI and producer prices are indirectly and inversely connected. EROI, that's here. We've got decline and producer prices incline, right, EROI decline, producer prices incline. That's fairly evident from just assessing the graph without even going through all the statistics. Uh, and the data show inverse correlation between producer price and EROI. That's exactly what they just said. So here we come across a model. They assessed four different models. They did some statistical tests, probably using SPSS or a similar program and they came across a logarithmic model using their data uh, where the cost of energy production during a time is equal to some variable A times E to the negative B times EROI plus C, right, where, e, where A equals 466, B is uh, 0.359, C in dollars per barrel is 1271, and then R squared which is our correlation coefficient. The higher this is, the better, right? So they've chosen number two. Uh, notice that number four has a slightly higher correlation coefficient, but number four did not contribute at any, A in number four did not contribute at any confidence level. And in the next video, I'll look at SPSS and we can look at those confidence intervals. Whereas for number two, we have 99.9% and 95%. Uh, for our values there and so they reject model number four and go along with model number two and so this is the projected this is the projected EROI cost this is the cost per EROI uh, projected in, in the United States right which roughly models the world right So low EROI and high producer prices are correlated. Does that correlate to high prices at the pump or for consumers? Well, that's a more complicated issue. Uh, but that should be sufficient for this article, for this video here. Uh, I just wanted to refresh, reinforce the idea that 
even though these articles and some textbooks have a lot of really funky looking kind of odd looking equations with a number of different letters and sub subscripts and superscripts they really amount to just multiplication addition a little bit of exponents some fractions basic arithmetic a little bit of algebra the most complicated algebra we have in any of these probably is the substitution here and that's that's a really quite simple algebra to to substitute different variables for for their equivalent components and come to some fraction which is just uh, a three this is two things multiplied by one another divided by the difference of a whole number and a fraction it's really quite simple mathematics that doesn't have to be so intimidating. I'll come back in another video and look at some empirical data with SPSS.